Of all the villains in Bleach, of all the enemies that Ichigo and his friends face and fight throughout the storyline, within that core central conflict that makes up the very foundation of the Bleach universe, Shinigami vs. Hollow, there's no better villain that embodies that darker antagonistic half of the tale than the fourth Espada. Cold, calculating, clinical and statuesque, Ukiora is in my mind the ultimate hollow villain in the series. Having the aspect of death, nothingness or nihilism, emptiness, Ukiora in my opinion is the true epitome of what makes a hollow in this series. Someone who is missing something vital to themselves, missing that core component that should make you human, and instead has left them a sort of cold, almost lifeless shell of a being constantly searching, constantly hungry, constantly needing to devour, to fill that unfillable void that makes them hollow. And in, in so many ways, Ulkiora so truly reinforces and embodies that ideal that makes him the ultimate counterpart to the truly human Ichigo. And as we've mentioned many times on this channel before, the Iran car arc, which is Bleach's longest and in many aspects I would say most famous or at least most renowned story arc, one of the core tenets of that arc was Ichigo's devolution into hollowdom, his descent into darkness and madness, his being pulled down, being dragged down by the inhabitants of Waco Mundo to their level with every successive fight that he has. Ulkiora is a dark reflection of that, an embodiment of what Ichigo might become at the very bottom of this cavern, this black bottom, this hole that is becoming a hollow. Ulkiora himself, as we know from his backstory, was born of this darkness. You know, he was born at the bottom of a deep, dark, cavernous pit. And that's the very same metaphorical pit that Ichigo is heading towards the further into Waco Mundo, the further into Las Noches he gets. And of course, fittingly, he reaches that point in his final battle against, you guessed it, Ulkiora. And so in many ways, Ulkiora is both the figurative and literal embodiment of that black pit that is becoming a hollow, that emptiness inside that is the key component of every hollow in the series. And so in this video, we're going to be taking a deep dive look at the villainous Ulkiora Cypher? Schiffer? I've never been entirely sure how to pronounce his surname, but it's one, something like that, um, who is, in my opinion, the principal villain of the second third of the Iran car arc, taking over from Grimajo and eventually ceding to Aizen as the arc comes to a close. And in many ways, Ulkiora presides over perhaps the most famous part of the Iran car arc as well. So we're going to be trying to do a deep dive character analysis into one of Bleach's most famous and most recognisable, most impactful villains in the entire story. So no pressure. Before we begin, however, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up as well as it really does help support me and the channel as it means the video should hopefully get more exposure on the whole YouTube algorithm, meaning more Bleach fans like yourselves get a chance to see it. And if you want to take that support from me another step further, we do have a Patreon for the channel as well now where you can go and support me over there. You can get videos like this one early and you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. Every name appearing on the screen right now are people who are supporting me over there on Patreon. I couldn't do this without you and I truly appreciate your support. Thank you so very much. So I'll be totally honest with you from the off. Ulkiora is and pretty much has always been one of my absolute favourite characters in the series. I know that's pretty, that's a bit of a cliche pick. Although my favourite character is Aizen, so it probably doesn't get more cliche than that. And I'm not afraid to admit that. Um, but there's a lot about Ulkiora that makes him so compelling and it goes beyond the surface as well. Yes, he has an awesome design. He looks so cool, so instantly memorable, but there's way more to him than that. And what I like about Ulkiora as well is it's not immediately apparent. You could be forgiven for thinking that Ulkiora basically doesn't change throughout his entire time in Bleach, his entire tenure as a bad guy in the series. He's very cold very serious, completely, utterly humorless, 
and basically just acts as a sort of robot for Aizen, someone who just fulfills his orders with efficiency and ruthlessness. And he's basically like that through to the very end. But all Kiora's character development, his arc, is a little more subtle than that, culminating in what I believe to be one of Bleach's most emotional moments um, of the entire series. Being a villain who does eventually get killed off, all Kiora's manga lifespan isn't crazy long, although he is definitely one of the most prevalent bad guys in the entire series, with his first appearance being chapter 190 right near the start of the Orankar arc, and his final appearance being 354, kind of as we roll into the main course of the fake Karakura town. And as we move into his personality and his appearance and just his kind of character overview, as I said, this character is just utterly iconic. There's something about his sort of weird, sad clown appearance that's just so memorable. It's so simplistic, but also just so iconic as well. Of course, the main factor of this character are his eyes, his massive bulbous emerald green eyes that appear to be unmoving, unblinking in their emotion. And I just love the way it looks with those kind of teardrop lines running down his face. Um, he's just awesome. He's so cool. He looks amazing. He's quite sinister, but also maybe a little bit unassuming at the same time. He's quite small in stature, quite skinny, has his hands in his pockets nearly all the time, and in many ways embodies those manga tropes of that character who you know is very powerful, but doesn't do a whole lot to begin with, doesn't look like they might be that strong, um, but he's really hiding some pretty nasty secrets. But overall, I've just always thought Ulkior is so effortlessly cool in his design and so memorable as well. But of course, there's more than that too. The very pale skin he has that appears to be drained of any life is just reinforces that idea that he is empty inside. He's a hollow shell, a husk, someone who knows nothing. But And, and we'll get into this a little bit more in the future, but Ulkiora fully believes that he, you know all he can see is what exists. He doesn't believe in anything that he can't see. He believes only in the corporeal, not the ethereal. And that's a vital part of his character, a vital part of this idea that there is essentially nothing in him in a spiritual sense, which is something we'll get into a bit later on. And in a way, you kind of feel a bit sorry for the character in that regard, too. And Ulkiora's personality, as I said, he mostly comes across as an agent of Aizen, someone who is willing to follow orders to the T, someone who carries them out with ruthless pragmatism, someone who doesn't tolerate insubordination, and basically everything Ulkiora does is for Aizen's agenda, for moving forward with Aizen's plans. And while that is all Ulkiora might seem on the surface, there is a longing for something more. As we know from his backstory in uh, 2B But B, I think it's called, we know that he is always searching, that innate lust to find something that you are missing that all hollows share. We know Ulkiora has had since the moment he came into the world in the most kind of dank and black pit there possibly was in Waco Mundo. If there was a hell within hell, Ulkiora was born in it and crawled out of it, came out the top and upon the desert sands of Waco Mundo. Ulkiora makes his first appearance, as I said, right at the start of the Oran Kar arc, arriving in Karakura Town with the Sparta number 10, Yami Largo, who would sort of act as a kind of de facto partner to Ulkiora moving forward through the series, even though they don't really share anything in common outside of being near total opposites from each other, Ulkiora being small, reserved, quiet, very powerful, and Yami being large, brash, reckless, and seemingly fairly weak, although obviously not really. The whole thing, of course, being a massive homage to the arrival of Vegeta and Nappa in the earliest days of Dragon Ball Z. Ulkiora doesn't do an awful lot during this, apart from being a watchful observer, giving orders to Yami as the fight progresses, but there's a wonderful moment that really helped build the hype for this character when Kisuke Urahara attempts to attack Yami with a strike from Benahime and Ulkiora just blocks it and sends it flying with his hand, removing his hand from his pocket in a very rare show of any kind of action, really, and I always loved that. I thought it was so cool. It was very exciting getting to see Ulkiora just 
effortlessly bat this attack away and just stare down his enemies as Kisuke looks on kind of shocked. And then Yami sort of gloats about it and Okura just whacks him in the gut and says, you know, we're leaving. Um, you know, we found our target, which of course was Ichigo. We get a nice little hint towards Ulkiora's exceptional regenerative abilities when he takes out his eye, crushes it and shows what he saw to everyone else there. And it's a really nice moment. It's really cool to see the kind of trust that Aizen puts in Ulkiora and the relationship that those two have, I think is quite an interesting one. One we'll delve into a little bit later. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Ulkiora is only really the main villain of the second third of this arc. So this first third, the main bad guy really is Grimjo, as he's the one with the most direct conflict, the most direct relationship with Ichigo. Ulkiora acts as kind of that sinister supervisor in the background who shows up every now and then. You know he's bad news, um, but he doesn't really lift too much of a finger. For now, he's taking orders from Aizen, he's watching the creation of Wonderwise, he leads the second assault on Karakura Town, and he eventually abducts Orihime, which is kind of the major crescendo of Ulkiora's villainy at the end of the first third of this arc, where he abducts her, he says, you know, she has no rights, she'll come with him. And it starts this kind of snowball effect that would lead to an interesting relationship between these two characters. And throughout the Waco Mundo arc, Ulkiora and Orihime share an intriguing relationship. He is obviously her kidnapper, and Aizen has also left him in charge of her. He's not going to hurt Orihime, but he will threaten her, he will try and break her spirit. And it's quite fascinating to see Orihime, of course, being highly emotive, you know, so in, so fully vested in her friends, her friendships, her bonds. She remains something of a perplexing figure for Ulkiora, someone who only believes in what he sees. The physical world in front of him is the only thing that exists. And so to Ulkiora, someone like Orihime, who so puts so much faith in the bonds of friendship, is a complex character indeed. There's a level of refreshing naivety with Ulkiora, I think, which is what you're supposed to get from his character, in that he just doesn't understand Orihime. He doesn't... I feel like he doesn't understand the way she reacts a lot of the time. You get the impression that he is trying to mentally break her, especially when her friends arrive in Waco Mundo and they start falling one by one. Rukia is taken down by Aruniero and everyone kind of thinks she's dead. When Ulkiora kind of just kind of just it belittles and and insults her friends saying and saying things from her perspective like if my friends were stupid enough to throw their lives away by coming to Waco Mundo to fight a fight that was obviously unwinnable I'd be disgusted with them I'd be I would think they were being stupid Orihime slaps him across the face in a very rare show of complete defiance for this character Orihime being so non-violent as we mentioned in a previous video about her that for her to take the initiative and actually hit someone shows you just how incensed Ulkiora's words are making her it's difficult to know, though, if Ulkiora truly wants this reaction, or if he's literally just saying what makes the most sense to him. Is he, is he trying to rile her up? I don't really know why he would want to do that, because his whole goal is to break her into thinking that she is Aizen's servant. Or is he just saying these things because that's what makes the most sense to him? He is unfeeling. He is cold, he is empty inside, and it's this that makes me reinforce the notion that I think he is the ultimate hollow bad guy in the series. He, when he says these things about, I would be disgusted if, if my friends came to save me and threw their lives away in an unwinnable fight, I think he's just saying what makes the most sense to him, and that's what's so fascinating about their relationship, this dichotomy between the two of them that seemingly is a bridge that can't be crossed. You know, they just, they have no compatibility whatsoever. Orihime fully puts all her faith in her friends. She knows from past experience that she would do the same for them, even if the fight seemed insurmountable. Because that's what it means to have bonds, to have friends, to want to throw your life away in a fight if there's a chance to save them. And Ulkiora stands cold and alone and un and just with a complete misunderstanding of, of these bonds. And as we'll see later on, 
he even starts to consider them a weakness. But Ulkyora is not completely depraved either. There are definitely worse people in Waco Mundo, as we see when he's approached by the fifth Esparta, Neutra, who, you know, being very sexist, being a bit of a monster in many ways, kind of implies that Ulkyor is up to no good with Orihime, saying, you know, how, how far have you taken her, how far have you taken her training, have you tamed your pet yet? To which Ulkyor calls him, you know, disgusting, and he doesn't want anything to do with that. And that's because Ulkyor, again, has no kind of notion of that, has no, has nothing inside him that would make him remotely human, even if it's, even if it's something bad. Which, of course, is why Ulkyora's main fight, his main moment, each chapter was named after one of the seven deadly sins, because Ulkyora is missing all of them, or at the very least begins to kind of, begins to kind of get them as that fight goes on. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's for a little bit later. And what's interesting as well about this moment where he talks with Neutra, because Ulkyora really, in my opinion, is now taking the reins of the main villain of the series, he seems to have a, an understanding of Aizen that many other characters just do not have. And you have to remember as well that Aizen is supposed to be a godlike figure in many ways, not just literally, but also figuratively as well. In the way the Uran car see him, he's not supposed to be on their level, on their plane. Really, the only character I would say is, is Gein from the Shadows, and, and perhaps Kaname as well. But Ulkyora seems to have a level of understanding of their master that many of the other Espada just simply couldn't grasp. When Ulkyora says that, you know, this is this is just a game to Eisen, you know. He, at the end of the day, this is all just a kind of distraction, um, and that's something that he seems to be able to realise, but that many people can't. Is that Eisen's just toying with virtually everyone in virtually every scenario, um, and as we find out, that's absolutely true. Him kidnapping Orihime, it's all just a big ruse at the end of the day. Losing Espada to these these many Espada get killed in the rescue effort to save Orihime, and it's all it is all just a front for Aizen at the end of the day, which is something that Ulkyora at the very least seems to be able to understand. We then get a very short fight, but in my opinion, completely iconic, being Ichigo versus Ulkyora round one, which is just over in a flash, but it's so good. And it's so good in both the manga and the anime. They play, I think, hollowed in the anime when Ichigo leaps out with his mask on and he activates Getsuga Tensho. It's just totally... It is completely iconic, this little scuffle. But in the manga, it's drawn lovely. You know, Ulkyor is standing at the top of these stairs, looking down at Ichigo. The light is behind him. He's shadowed. It's just a really, really nicely done scene. Ichigo recognises that Ulkyora is very, very dangerous, and he doesn't strike him until Ulkyora realises that he is the one who basically abducted Orihime against her will, making it look like that she had betrayed the Soul Society. And there's this lovely clash. Ichigo attempts to attack Ulkyora. He just simply blocks it with his hand. And there's this whole thing that Ulkyora sees Ichigo as being barely worth raising a fist to. Ichigo goes all out immediately in this fight where there's a wonderful picture of him basically swinging a massive Getsuga Tensho and he just throws it at Ulkyora. Ulkyora is forced to bring a hand out to try and stop it and then has to bring out a second hand to try and stop it. And even then he can't and he's completely overwhelmed by this attack. And he, like Grimjo, is surprised at Ichigo's progress. Ichigo, of course, now can use his hollow mask for a little bit longer than he could in Karakura Town. And so his power has increased dramatically from the last time Ulkyora saw him. But it's still not enough. And there's just a brilliant moment where the dust settles and Ulkyora is there, basically completely unharmed with a slightly ripped outfit. And he's like, OK, I think that's probably the best you've got. That's a little bit disappointing. And he just points a finger at Ichigo and fires a massive green Cero at him. Again, the whole scenario, the whole sequence of events is just so iconic and was easily one of my absolute favourite moments in this arc growing up. I loved it so much. Just, just Ichigo's massive attack, especially with Hollowed going in the background, Ulkyora unable to block it, but then still being basically totally fine. This all builds and builds, of course, to one of the series' greatest twists, in my opinion. And that's a video I actually am thinking about making very soon, Bleach's greatest twists. And this is very clever on Kubo's part, I think, although it's a bit of a double-edged sword as well. 
basically the way Kubo has presented Ulkiora so far, you know, sending him to be the initial person to meet in Karakura Town, basically seemingly giving him a lot of responsibility, a lot of trust from Aizen that other characters just don't seem to have, keeping him in the in the minds of the readers, but leaving him slightly more in the shadows, having him be the one to go and get Orihime. It's not unreasonable. Obviously, it's very foreign to us now because everybody in their right mind knows who the what knows what ranks the Espada are. But back then, when this was coming out weekly, it wasn't unfathomable that Ulkiorda was the top Espada because the amount of limelight he'd been given, his position seemingly in Waco Mundo. And Ichigo thinks this as well, as the avatar of the reader in this situation, near defeated, he manages to ram Tensor Zangetsu into Ulkiora's shoulder, and he says, you know, you're the top Esparda. I'm, I'm willing to give everything to defeat you, because if I do, the others will be easy pickings. And Ulkiora's like, oh, I, 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 see what, I see what you're your line of thought is, and he just uses tensors and gets you to rip rip open his outfit, revealing to an absolutely aghast Ichigo the tattoo number four. It's a it's a really great moment, and Ulkiora even says to him, even if you somehow defeat me, there are three other Espada who are stronger than I am, and it's supposed to be a soul crushing moment, a twist that just destroys our hero because he's like, I, I can't even, ba I can barely lay a finger on this guy. You know, Ichigo is like, if I could maybe muster everything to take down the number one Espada, we'd be okay, but it, it, he's not the number one. But of course, the reason I say this is a double-edged sword is because I think most people would agree with me in saying that the top three Espada end up being less impressive than Ulkiora overall, just because Ulkiora, Ulkiora is definitely treated as though he was the number one Espada in Kubo's eyes. He's given that level of prominence, that amazing final battle that really the top three just don't get. And, you know, maybe characters like Barragan have more broken abilities than Ulkiora, but he's certainly not given anywhere near as much limelight, which is a bit of a shame because it does come with that expectation that the top three will be stronger, more impressive, more dangerous than Ulkiora, but it never quite measures out like that. So that's a bit of a shame. But Ulkiora does his trademark punching Ichigo through the blooming rib cage, which is really quite gruesome when you think about it. There's something about it that's more gruesome than Grimjo putting his entire hand through Loopy. Just the way Ulkiora kind of gets it into the center of Ichigo's chest and then pulls it out again. It's pretty gross. I like this though, it's kind of cool. Grimjo mentions this is Ulkiora's trademark. He doesn't, he, he kind of ponders if Ulkiora even knows that he does it. Um, and I like that. That means it's kind of instinctive for Ulkiora to push his hand through Ichigo's chest, through his victim's chest. And I think that it's supposed to be a sort of metaphysical um, idea that Ulkiora is always searching for the heart. You know, this idea of the heart, which we'll get into. Ulkir is always looking for it, whether he knows he is or not. And clearly he doesn't realise that's what he's doing. But whenever he kills someone, he tries to find their heart. In, in, and it's not something he knows that he's doing. But it just feeds back to the idea that there is this unending need for a void to be filled within Ulkira's soul. Um, that he, he basically just wanders these deserts forever unfulfilled. And I think that, again, it's that he's, he's, he's a bit of a tragic character, although you don't really see that until much later on. For the majority of his time in the story, he is a remorseless, statuesque, Terminator-like evil. I think that's very effective. But just before the fated battle between Ichigo and Grimjo, we get a nice, admittedly, I think, pretty fan service -y moment where these two characters finally face off briefly. Grimjo takes on Ulkiora, because Ulkiora, again, can't stomach Grimjo's insubordination. Grimjo is way more human in many aspects than Ulkiora. Although Ulkiora is a Vasto Lord, and I don't think Grimjo becomes a Vasto Lord until beyond the Iran Karak, Grimjo exhibits very human like emotions, you know, anger, pride. You know, he wants to defeat Ichigo because he thinks that everyone's looking down on him, whereas Ulkiora is completely deadpan all the time. You know, he's just very, like, 
because he is supposed to be empty inside. And this is the clash of those ideals. The fact that Grimjo manages to get one up on Ulkiora is a little bit hard to believe. I think Ulkiora probably would have absolutely destroyed him if the fight had really continued on at this, at this stage in the story. Um, but, you know, Grimjo at the very least uses smarts to beat him, dropping a Kaha Negathion into Ulkiora's hollow hole, which traps him within basically a prison for just a couple of hours. But it's a nice little spectacle anyway. I always like Ulkior appearing above him, attempting to do a Cero. Gr the, the, just the ballsy nature of Grimjo to then grab his finger as the Cero is going and activate his own one. I do respect that. And that whole little scenario is nice. But the stage is now set for the fake Karakura Town arc and Ulkior smashes out of the Negathion just as Aizen is invading Karakura Town and says that he is now going to basically be the warden of Waco Mundo while Aizen is away. Once again, Aizen giving major trust to Ulkiora. And you could say, well, it's just because Ulkiora is the highest ranking person left in Waco Mundo, and that's probably true. But at the same time, Aizen speaks, you know, directly to him, saying, I'm leaving Last Notches in your hands, Ulkiora. And again, they do seem to have this. Aizen seems to trust Ulkiora on a level that he doesn't trust too many other people. My assumption here is that Aizen just knows that Ulkiora will get the job done, no questions asked, and that's what he's kind of looking for in a servant, a very powerful servant, but one who's tightly on Aizen's leash, and that's that works very well for Aizen. Uh, we know that Aizen just totally sees the Espada as pawns for the most part, which I think is very fitting with his character. He has a kind of bond with Gein and Kaname. We see that in the manga. We see that in Can't Fear Your Own World. But the Espada, Aranka, Hollows, are just totally beneath him, I think. And he just kind of sees the Espada as completely expendable, as such as we see his disgust when Haribel, he takes out Haribel. But with Ulkura, at least, there seems to be a measure of respect um, even if I, maybe Eisen is feigning it, I don't know, but it's cool to see nonetheless. And here we get, obviously, the major final battle between Ichigo and Ulkiora, but that's prefaced by a nice conversation Ulkiora has with Orohime. They finally are alone together once again, but the situation has changed. Ichigo and his friends are now careening towards Las Notches to finish the fight. Eisen and the top Espada have left the palace, and basically war is, is breaking out. You know, everything is going crazy. The cap Some captains are now in Waco Mundo. So Orohime is not quite as isolated as she once was. And in fact, the whole situation has been turned on its head. But regardless, it's just her and Ulkiora in the throne room currently. And he asks her, you know, you're alone now. You know, no one's going to be able to save you. Are you afraid? And she says no, because her heart beats with her friends. And, you know, she knows they're all here. She knows they're all all right. And they are all they're all going to come and come and try and save her regardless. But their hearts beat as one. It doesn't matter where they are, their bonds, they, they can kind of feel each other and they understand each other. And as, as long as she has them, she kind of has strength. And that goes equal for everyone. It's not just an Orohime thing. It's not just it's not just she's the only one who relies on her on them. They all rely in equal measure on each other. And then in the opposite, you have Ulkiora, who stands alone against the darkness of Waco Mundo, completely just not still, you know, flabbergasted at this woman who's staring into the face of what should be certain death. And she's completely defiant. Someone who he was trying to break, and she just, she just still is banking on her friends, even though, as we've discussed already, they were throwing their lives away in Ulkiora's eyes previously, and he's, he says, you know, you humans are always going on about the heart, like it's something you can see. You know, he's like, he doesn't get it. He's like, you, you're saying your hearts all beat as one because your hearts all live inside each other. I don't understand it. What are you talking about? Because Ulkiora lives in this, you know, pretty horrible, claustrophobic, trapped existence where the only things that exist are things that his eye can see. And he says that to her. He spells it out to her. He says, if my eye can't see it, it doesn't exist. And so he's like, the heart must be a literal thing. And he says, you know, if I break open your skull, 
Will I find it in there? Is that where the heart lives? If I rip open your chest and we see him kind of put his hand towards her chest in the same manner as he, do, as he would when he takes out one of his victims, which is what makes me think that's the same thing. He says, if I rip it open, will I find the heart there? And you kind of understand that Ulcura is more than curious. He's tormented by this idea of maybe this is the thing that he is missing, but he just doesn't understand it. He doesn't see how it's beneficial for humans to have this, to have this thing that they fight for that drives them to fight. This idea of a heart, this idea of bonds, of friendship that forces them to put themselves in dangerous situations is so totally alien to Ulkiora, alien to the Hollow who was born into complete pitch blackness, who had to kill to survive, and only eventually found something he could kind of, something he could kind of not necessarily relate to, but something he needed in this massive thorny white bush when he broke himself into it, when he pushed himself into the thorns, into the branches, and it ripped away parts of his mask. And he finally, for once in his life, felt peace at the base of this tree, which turned him into a natural-born Arankar because he broke off parts of his own mask himself. That is the one time in Ulkiora's life he has kind of felt at peace, where he has found something that helps to complete him. And since then, he's been on that journey again. And that's why I think Waco Mundo is such a cool place, because Waco Mundo, more so than any other location in the series, reflects its inhabitants. You know, it's a vast, endless expanse of darkness. You know, it's just a pitch black night draped like a curtain across this, this desolate wasteland. And these hollows are kind of doomed to wander this wasteland, constantly searching, that having that need to grow, to find something, to fill the emptiness within them. And as his aspect of death is emptiness, Ulkiora, as I mentioned at the start of this video, truly embodies most of all what it means to be a hollow and to be searching uh, for that one thing they need to complete them. Now, I, I really like this whole heart thing Ulkiora has going on. It was kind of added in quite late into his character, but you do get the impression it's something that Kubo was working with from the earliest days of Ulkiora being uh, a character in this series, especially since he moves his hollow hole. Originally, Ulkiora's hollow hole was kind of in his throat, and then it eventually ends up closer to where his heart might be. Um, and I, I like this whole I like this whole idea of a villain almost like unintentionally seeking out humanity. And this takes us back to the dichotomy of journeys that characters go on in the Arankar arc. And of course, the big upcoming fight between Ichigo and Ulkiora is one of the series' most famous, one of the best fights in the entire Bleach story. A totally transformative battle that starts out like any other fight, and by the time they get on the dome things just go totally south in a way you would never expect, but it acts as the ultimate culmination of the Arankar arc. Really, the Arankar arc kind of ends here in many ways. Certainly some of the biggest journeys end here, and then you just get a succession of fights in the fake Karakura town to really wrap things up. But certainly thematically, uh, a lot of the biggest themes of this arc are closed up here. I'm not going to go into crazy detail about this fight. We've talked about it before in a couple of videos, and obviously I want to do a battle analysis on this in the future, which will be a hefty one. But one of the major themes of Bleach is bonds, the bonds of friendship. And, you know, the entire Lost Agent arc is about the breaking of these bonds. And so it's really cool to see how different villains in the series embody a bastardization of bonds in different ways. Perhaps the most famous is, of course, Tsukishima, who quite literally warps, twists, and manipulates the bonds of friendship. Then there's Hashwolf in the final arc, who basically thinks that friendship is something that should benefit you. If you're getting nothing out of it, it's not worth it. You should have to sacrifice something to get something else, this idea of balance. And so Hashwolf is willing to discard the bonds he has established, the natural bonds he's established with Basby, 
to get a slightly more, shall we say, artificial bond with Yuha Bark because Hashwolf will get something out of it. Then there's Ulkiora, who is totally different again in that he just doesn't understand them at all. He doesn't believe the bonds of friendship exist. That's what the idea of the heart actually is, the bonds of friendship that people share between them. And Ulkiora, because it's not something literal, because he's not holding a bloody heart in the palm of his hand, he cannot fathom what it means. And this whole fight is about that. You know, Ichigo strives to fight, even though he's massively outmatched. And Ulkiora calls him out on it at one point, saying, if to be human is to have a heart, and if to have a heart means you will put yourself in harm's way, then to have a heart is to be weak. To be to be human is to be weak. And Ulkiora tries to shut this down. You know, he tries to say, you know, you are weak because of the heart. The heart makes you weak. These bonds will get you killed. And it's because of these bonds that you will die to me now. And of course, Ichigo does die in this fight. It's the ultimate cul culmination, which leads to the ultimate culmination of his journey into Hollowdom. He is brutally killed and transforms into an absolute monster which eviscerates Ulkiora, but then also turns on his friends as well. But it's also because of Bonds that this monster is really born in the first place. In this horrible form, Ichigo gutturally tries to say that he will protect Orihime. That's all he's going to do. That's all his mind will do in this form, and that means killing everyone around him, including characters like Uryu. And so, as the fight comes to its natural conclusion, as we reach the end of the battle... Ulkiora, Ulkiora kind of, you know, the perspective changes. Ichigo is now the villain. He's now this horrible monstrosity that will just destroy everything in its path. And while not necessarily altruistic in motive, Ulkiora saves Uryu's life by severing Ichigo's horn from behind um, at great personal risk to himself. Now, I don't necessarily think Ulkiora is necessarily trying to save Uryu, but it was more if I somehow stop this monstrosity, maybe I've got a chance of surviving. But regardless, Ulkiora cuts off Ichigo's horn and Ichigo is returned to normality. But the main, I think the main reason for this moment is to show Ulkiora in a, in a, in the light of a saviour to really flip the character on his head. Ichigo is now the monstrous villain. You can't see his face at all. It's behind this mask. Ulkiora, you can see his face. You know, he looks kind of terrified. Um, but he's now, inadvertently perhaps, fighting on the side of Orihime. And this is the ultimate parallel between these characters, which is why I think Ulkiora is the superior, is the most impressive epitome of what it means to be a hollow in the series, because right up until this point, the parallel between him and Ichigo has been Ichigo is becoming more like a hollow, Ulkiora is becoming more like a human. And Ulkiora might see that as a weakness, but what he doesn't quite understand just yet is that is that is potentially what he has been missing all this time. And Ichigo even spells it out for us at the start of this fight, saying, you know, I'm starting to be able to read your movements a bit better. Perhaps I'm becoming more like you, or maybe you're becoming easier to read because you're becoming more like a human. And Ulkiora reacts pretty negatively to that. But actually, at the very end of the fight here, where their roles have almost been reversed, Ulkiora starts to finally understand. In what is still one of the most emotional moments of the series, Ulkiora and Ichigo, Ichigo now return to his normal self, are primed to continue their fight, but suddenly Ulkiora's wing bursts into dust and he realises his time is up. He has been pushed past the point of no return. Even though his body is regenerating, it's superficial. Everything Ichigo destroyed inside him is not coming back, and it's the end. Ulkiora's time has run out. And there's just a nice moment where he says, you know, kill me now, because if you don't, our battle will never be truly over. And Ichigo says, I won't do it. You know, he's like, I'm not going to, this isn't how the fight should have ended. You know, I won't kill you like this. And Ulkiora is on his deathbed still confounded by these people. You know, as he stares at them, he's like, he's seeing no malice. He's seeing no will to murder Ichigo. That hollow-like instinct is now gone again and replaced by the very human Ichigo. 
And all Kiora says, you know, even in my final moments, right until the very end, you don't do what I expect you to do. Because he doesn't, un- he still doesn't quite understand what it means to be human. Ichigo is not going to cut down a foe who is basically dying anyway. Who's missing an arm and a leg. I- Ichigo even goes so far as to say, take my arm and leg. And I remember that actually kind of annoyed a lot of people back in the day because Ichigo kind of whinging about how I didn't want to win like this when everyone was about to die anyway. Um, but crucially, you know, you kind of have to separate yourself from it a little bit and and realise that this is supposed to be the embodiment of the human side of Ichigo, saying, I didn't want to win this way. I wanted to win with some nobility, with some honour. Whereas you flash back to the the monstrous version of Ichigo, the instinctual version of Ichigo, slamming his foot on Okiura's head, even after slicing him down the middle, and Okiura even verbalising, saying, no mercy, eh? How very hollow-like of you. So hollows are just going to... Uh, it's very hollow of someone to kill someone defenceless, like Ulkiora does. Ichigo can't fight back. He's got his neck caught in Ulkiora's tail, and Ulkiora still shows him no mercy and shoots him through the chest and kills him. But now, when Ulkiora is at the end of his tether, Ichigo won't swing his sword at him. He won't bring his blade down and and to finish him off like that. And the final moment between the two of them, Ulkiora raises his hand to Orohime. You know, this girl who he has been trying to figure out all this time. Someone who is such a believer in this metaphysical idea of the heart. And he says to her, are you afraid? And Orohime sees nothing but a pitiful creature anymore no one not someone to be afraid but someone to be pitied someone who is about to pass on and so you know she holds no malice to him anymore and she says i'm not afraid and she lifts out her hand to try and and grab his but okiora turns to dust and blows away before before they can touch hands but in that final moment, as Ulkiora is disappearing, as his face is literally turning to ash before them, and their hands nearly meet, he finally realises what it means to have a heart, what it means to... What, what a heart actually means. And in his outstretched hand, even though it doesn't exist anymore, he says, in my hand, this is a heart. And so what it, what it, what it finally dawns on Ulkiora is that Orohime, in that moment, cares for him, shows him sympathy. She reaches out to him, as opposed to recoiling or not moving at all. And in that split second moment before his death, a bond is forged. Um, And it's powerful stuff. And Orohime is the perfect character for this as well, because she's always been the character to understand the villain side of things, to see the point of the bad guy, or even just to feel sympathy for them. Like when Mayuri detonates those Shinigami, Orohime is crying. And Maki, the other Shinigami, doesn't understand it. He's like, why is she crying? These are her enemies. And here, in Ulkiora's final moments, as he blows harmlessly, helplessly away into the wind, he kind of like reaches out to her in a final desperate attempt to take what he's been missing, the heart. And Orohime gives it to him. She reaches out in return, uh, which is the last thing he sees before he dies. And so when he dies, he finally understands what it is to have that heart. He finally understands what it is that humans fight for. And Ulkiora will forever go down in history, in Bleach history, as being definitely one of the most popular, one of the most influential characters in the series. And his change is subtle, but very effective. And... He certainly is one of my favourite characters, and I've always just adored that final fight, how it really goes through the motions, starting out as a relatively normal bleach battle, loads of characters jumping in, it's a bit of a free-for-all, but it changes. The scenery changes, they eventually go above the dome, it's suddenly nighttime, very sinister. Ulkiora activates his Resurrection, just destroys Ichigo, but Ichigo keeps fighting, keeps getting back up. And that's what Okiura just cannot fathom, because he's a pragmatist. He thinks that everything that exists before his eyes is all there is. And so he sees Ichigo 
in that moment as a wounded animal, as someone who just shouldn't keep fighting because he's so injured, he's so near death, and that's all Ulkiora can see and understand, the very surface layer. But of course, burning like a fire within Ichigo is the resolve and the desire to win that fight no matter what, to protect his friends, to save his friends, and that's why He'll continue to lift his blade no matter how battered his body is. And that's why Ulkura lashes out at him. He shouts at him. He says, I'm telling you, it's worthless. And he smacks Ichigo, sends him flying, because he just he's becoming so infuriated. But this is Ulkura himself growing, gaining those human traits. That's why the chapters are named after the sloth, the greed, the gluttony, the wrath, the lust. Because Ulkura, he, he's slowly getting those human traits that he has been totally missing as the fight goes on. You know, he quite clearly has, he quite clearly gets angry with Ichigo here in this situation. He quite clearly shows wrath when he transforms into his Segunda Etapa, when he wants to teach Ichigo the meaning of true despair, to bring him down to his level. And so the character is really nicely done, even though it might seem like there's maybe little to him on the surface, there's actually a lot beneath the surface, which of course is the great irony for Ulkiora's character. Now, I think a lot of fans would love to see Ulkiora return in whatever way possible. And I believe his death was actually voted something like the most impactful moment in, in a manga series in the year it came out, if I remember rightly. But I think Ulkiora coming back after such a definitive end to not only his character, but his journey would be a bit of a betrayal in many ways. It's not the same as Grimjo, where his defeat anyway was completely ambiguous and he was just left on the ground the last time we saw him. Ulkiora, it's pretty definitive. He dies, he turns to ash, but just before he goes, just before he can be left with regrets, he finally understands. And to, to, to erase that would be to take away a big chunk of the character, I think. But maybe he's in hell, although I kind of feel like because he actually turned to dust... Similarly to Barragon, it's going to be difficult for him to come back in any kind of way, but I could be wrong. Being a primary villain for a big chunk of the series, Ulkiora is, of course, privy to a number of different relationships. As we've brought up, he has a sort of respectful relationship with Aizen. Aizen treats him almost like a number two, despite the fact that it's kind of arbitrary that Ulkiora is actually just the fourth Espada. But he seems to have more respect, more responsibility than even characters like Stark and Haribel. Barrigan, I can understand, not exactly being a big fan of Aizen. But those two don't really seem to have anywhere near the same level of responsibility as Ulkiora. So there's definitely something going on there. It's kind of like maybe Aizen looks at Ulkiora and he sees someone who maybe understands what he's trying to do here. Someone who can follow his vision. A hollow unlike the rest of them. Unruly you know, dogs. Aizen sees them as these unruly beasts who he, he's who are just there to be used. But Ulkiora is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, Ulkiora even gets a nice moment where he chats with Gein briefly, which I think is really cool because Gein, of course, is highly emotive, um, always hiding his true self behind a veneer of big smiles and, and kind of sarcasm and all this sort of thing. And Ulkiora is just what you see is what you get. Totally empty, just blank a blank slate almost which i think is really a really again a nice little juxtaposition between those two and much in the same much in the way kaname kind of calls gene out and says that wonderweiss and he are attracted to one another because they are both pure beings i think kaname would probably say the same about ulkiora and then of course ulkiora has relationships with his fellow espada with yami he has kind of like a superior subordinate relationship which is interesting although yami of course trash talks him after he dies anyway. Um, and then with Grimjo, you know, they are just total opposites of the scale. Ulkiora is order, Grimjo is chaos. Kubo does like to reuse tropes in different arcs. There's no denying that Ulkiora and Grimjo are the new Byakia and Renji, and that's reused again with Hashwolf and Basby. And but, it, you know, it works here as well. They have a great relationship. Grimjo is openly insubordinate to both Ulkiora and Aizen, and that's something Ulkiora just doesn't respect at all, which leads to a pretty inevitable showdown, I would say. In some respects, it's a bit of a shame that, Ul that Grimjo never kind of acknowledges Ulkiora's death. You never 
You never hear that again, even after Grimjo's return in the Thousand Year Blood War. That is a bit of a shame. Um, but, you know, you kind of imagine that Grimjo's always kind of seen Ulkiora as someone who stands in his way to becoming the king of Waco Mundo, uh, even though it's not something I imagine Ulkiora would ever have any interest in whatsoever. And then, as we've mentioned, his relationships with Ichigo and Orohime are based, are predicated on a on, a, a, on an, a misunderstanding or not being able to fathom them or how they work, how they mentally understand these bonds they all share, how they have this beating heart between them is something that Ulkiora doesn't know he needs, but he does need. And so seeing that really be brought to life in that final battle is just so exceptionally well done. And just briefly about Ulkiora's Resurrections, this was obviously going to be a, a pretty, uh, a moment that would come with high expectation for Kubo. You know, Ulkiora being clearly one of the most popular characters he's ever created, him releasing his Zanpak Toe was always going to be a big deal. And I actually think that it was always going to be something that disappointed people pretty much no matter what. And he does eventually use it. Uh, I think it's Bind Murcielago. And the first, his initial release form yeah, it's a little disappointing. I remember seeing it, thinking it looked cool enough, but being a little bit like, is that it? It it had what I wanted from Ulkiora to a degree, which was massive black bat wings. I really wanted him to have that. And I wanted him to have the proper helmet with the two horns. I was expecting his hollow mask to appear on the other side as well. And we got that. But there's no denying, there's just something about this form that's just not that threatening. Now... I, I thought maybe I was alone in this belief, but actually a lot of people share that belief. And so there's quite a bit of relief, I think, when he activates his Segunda Etapa. Part of me does wonder, did Kubo always plan to give Ulkiora a second form, or was he just maybe not overly happy with what he came up with for his first release? And so gave him something a bit more akin to what I always thought Ulkiora might have, which is this fully just like demonic bat version of himself. But it's cool as well, though, of course, that the Hollow Hole seemingly takes on new meaning with each form. In his first release, there are like black strands going towards it where kind of his gown meets in the middle. But, it, you know, it's it seems to be implying that everything comes back to the heart. Everything comes back to the center. But in his second release, where he has now become much further away from humanity than he could have been, he's become a monster. There's like blood oozing from his Hollow Hole now as if whatever hope there was of having a heart has been wrenched from his chest and now there's just a, a waterfall of blood that looks like it's cascading. It's pretty edgy, I admit. It's pretty edgy gothic, but I like it. I think it looks really cool in a sort of teenage angst way. But, you know, back in the day, I freaking loved it. When he transformed into this, I was like, that is exactly what I was hoping he would become. So I really can't hold it against him in any way, shape or form. He does look really cool. Um, but yeah, I think that really serves the final battle as well because it becomes a fight of demons which i think is again what helps it to stand out an awful lot but that's basically it for ulkiora one of the most famous one of the most impactful villains in all of bleach the fourth espada let me know what you think of this character in the comments below do you enjoy ulkiora's character is he one of your favorite characters or maybe you think he's actually a little bit overrated if you managed to get all the way to the end of this video i really appreciate it i know it's been a long one but there's a lot to say about ulkiora and like i said we, we got so much more to talk about in regards to that final battle which we'll do a battle analysis on at some point in the future but that's it from me, guys. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure to hit subscribe. I really appreciate the support. And until next time, I'll catch you later. I'll see you then.